Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Smart Policing Initiative webinar on Criminology 101. We're going to go ahead and get started here, and uh, we're going to begin with an introduction from our project director, Chip Coldren. Chip? Thank you, Zoe. Uh, this is Chip Coldren. Welcome, everybody, to this BJA CNA Smart Policing webinar titled Criminology 101, What Police Practitioners Need to Know About Criminological Research. This is certainly the largest participant audience we've had for the Smart Policing webinar so far. We're very pleased and thankful for your responses to our invitation. Let me first begin by thanking Professor Scott Decker for his leadership role in designing and presenting this webinar. Scott is a senior subject matter expert with Smart Policing. He's been with us from the very beginning and has been active on several fronts. Let me also thank Vivian Elliott, Zoe Thorkelson, Mike White, Hilde Sizow, and Chip Stewart at CNA, all of whom play important roles in taking these webinars from an initial idea to final delivery. In addition, let's all thank Kate McNamee and her colleagues at BJA, who provide tremendous support for these webinars and for smart policing overall. Kate, if you're on the line, would you like to just say a, a few words of welcome? Sure, Chip, and welcome everybody. On behalf of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, where I'm a policy advisor and I have really, truly the privilege of overseeing the Smart Policing Initiative, and I just want to thank you all for tuning in and taking time from what I know is uh, your, your busy job. Um, and as Chip said, we have a record turnout, which is encouraging um, as we kind of dive into going back to the basics of what we know from decades of criminological research and how we can apply it to the policing front. Um, you know, I'll have more info to share with all of you in terms of additional resources at the conclusion of today's webinar. Um, but again, just want to thank you welcome and to turn it back to uh, Jeff and Scott. Great. Hey, thank you very much. And thanks again for your tremendous support for Smart Policing. Uh, just permit me a few more details uh, before I turn this over to Scott. Uh, with this large participant audience, we're going to handle things a bit di differently on this webinar. So sometimes we hear some, some background noise. If it gets to be a little much, we have a global mute button that we can use here, and we may have to use that just to keep things quiet in the background. There's, uh, as usual, s several times during this presentation where we'll have a a stop and think or a stop and reflect opportunity. At that point, since there are so many people on, we're requesting that you not voice over your questions and comments, but use the chat window in the chat room to make your comments or log your questions there. I think that'll make it a bit better. As is usually the case, we will record this webinar so we can um, put it up on our website for other people to listen to in the future. And at the end, you'll receive an automatic prompt for an evaluation questionnaire pertaining to this webinar. We ask that you please pay attention to that. Um, there are some questions that you re are required to answer and some that are optional. So please, just please do your best to let us know what you think about this webinar. And we will use that information to plan our, our future ones. Now, let me just quickly turn this over to Scott Decker. Uh, he's a professor of criminology at Arizona State University, and one of our favorite subject matter experts on smart policing. Scott, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Coldren. Um, I'm pleased to be here this morning and a bit daunted, I must say, by um, the task of looking over mountains, literally, of criminological research that stretches back decades, indeed, at least a century and try to glean from that what really are key findings well established in the literature, not something that's been tested once and, and received lukewarm support, but things that really stand to the test of time and in different, uh, tested in different locations by different methodologies. So things we can really put some confidence in that when a police chief or a an executive in a police department, a commander, a sergeant, looks to these facts, um, they can feel confident that there really is solid empirical support with good research behind it. 
And so uh, with that, I'll, I'll also say that um, in sort of the style of uh, the contemporary society where we're looking at the top ten things about X, Y, or Z, I've condensed these to the top uh, ten key findings that everyone ought to know. And important um, that uh, to note that um, these will be on the web, uh, and you will be able to go back and look at them. And because the, the, I'm going to need to move through them uh, uh, fairly quickly, um, and there are a lot of slides. I'll, I'll talk for about 40 or 45 minutes. As, as Chip mentioned, there's a couple opportunities to stop and think, stop and ask, and then there'll be a chance for questions at the end. And I should also say um, that I am available for questions uh, later on as they may arise to you, or um, if you view this, if you're viewing this online weeks after the presentation, I can be reached uh, by email, and that's on the Smart Policing website. So we're, we're going to talk briefly today about why criminology matters. We're going to look at 10 key findings. And I think more importantly than just the findings, I'm going to talk about how they're relevant to practice. And this business of translational research, of taking good, solid research methodologies and findings, and then putting it into practice is really a, a core value for uh, the Smart Policing Initiative. And it's something that uh, the BJA has uh, supported certainly through the years, and I think that support is really exemplified in what's going on with, uh, uh, with Smart Policing today. So to, to move ahead to the 10 key facts, and you'll be seeing these uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, they're, they're enumerated here. Let's just jump in and start with number 10. These aren't in rank order of their importance or how strong the research is, but, but the first one we want to talk about is that gender makes a big difference. Um, this is uh, a finding that males outnumber females uh, by a substantial margin in crime, in offending, uh, by about 10 to 1. Now, it varies depending on the crime that you look at. Uh, males tend to be more overrepresented for violent crime, except for domestic violence. Um, the differences aren't quite as great for property crimes. Uh, and in one particular property crime, that shoplifting, women exceed the uh, offending rates of, of their male counterparts. Um, it, it's, it's important to know as well that we're, we're not talking about victims quite yet. We're going to get to victims as a separate category. Uh, we're, we're just talking about offenders at this, uh, at this point in the, in the presentation. So you might be saying to yourself, if you're uh, a police executive, uh, gee, you know, I was a patrol officer. Um, I know there's more men than women. I could tell you that anecdotally. I could tell you that from my city's crime statistics. Well, what might that mean? What interventions might that key finding suggest for us? And the, the first one, and I, and I think it's really important, is that prevention programs for young men are especially important. The more we can keep young men out of the front end, maybe only one involvement in crime or one interaction with the police or, or one arrest or one or two FI cards, um, and that's the extent of their involvement, the less likely they're going to be to penetrate the system later on where we know the costs and the consequences are quite substantial. And uh, in addition to thinking about prevention for, for young men, um, we should also think about intervention programs. And those kinds of programs that look for people who are at the early stages of trouble, who maybe have been to detention but only been once, who have a delinquent sibling, uh, who maybe been arrested, maybe even been adjudicated. If we can design intervention programs and support them, um, those are likely to pay dividends down the road because when 
when we pull one man, one boy out of the offending equation, we're going to see some substantial reductions in crime because of their overrepresentation. It's also the case that the police have a variety of roles to play throughout the policing and enforcement process. This is a, a real, another core value. You'll hear me say that a number of times today, uh, that this is a core value in, in smart policing, that rather than simply playing a suppression role, and I don't use the word simply to say that it, suppression is simple or easy, but by only playing a suppression role, the police are missing some solid opportunities to engage in other kinds of roles where they can also be very effective. Building strong relationships in communities is a real key for effective law enforcement and effective crime control. And those relationships, and, and we've seen just how important it is to have strong relationships to build community cooperation and community support in events in the news over the course of really the, the last three or four months in particular, but, but well beyond that. And when police are known beyond their suppression role and when they're identifiable with prevention and intervention roles, then their overall effectiveness increases. So smart policing incre encourages us to think beyond narrow traditional role definitions for criminal justice actors, especially law enforcement, um, and prevention and intervention, especially those activities as they focus on young men and boys, uh, can pay dividends. So we'll go to the next key finding, and that is relational distance matters. The implications of relational distance um, are, I think, really important to understand. And by that, we mean how, how close are people related to each other. It can be a family relationship, but it also can be a longstanding friendship. For many crimes, criminologists have found that familiarity breeds attempt, that crimes are committed between people who have a large degree of shared sentiment between each other, who know each other well, who have been involved, who have strong emotional attachments. Uh, and, and certainly we know that in uh, violent crime, uh, most of the victims know the offenders in, in one way or another, especially true, uh, obviously, in domestic violence and domestic assault. But it's also true in homicides, in a number, a large fraction of aggravated assaults, and increasingly uh, in robbery, we know that victims and offenders are known to each other. They may not be intimates. There are a variety of ways to know someone. It doesn't always have to be as an intimate, uh, but it also can be uh, as an acquaintance uh, or someone that has only been seen by the offender uh, just once. And certainly property uh, crimes are a good example of an area where criminologists have learned more uh, to show that victims are acquainted with offenders, especially in burglary. Um, many uh, burglary victims are victimized by individuals whom they've been introduced to as a, through a third party, whether it's at a party or at a, a gathering, an, an athletic event, a neighborhood gathering. And there is, in a sense, a third party who brings the victim and offender in, into contact with each other. Um, and so they come to know each other, not intimately, not well, not as friends, uh, uh, but, but it gives the offender, in a sense, a chance to soap out what the victim has. Certainly, Violent crime between intimates is the best example of how uh, relational distance matters. Uh, and criminologists have often also found that uh, when violence occurs between intimates, the extent or the intensity or depth of the relationship often produces what's called expressive violence. Well. What interventions does this suggest? What, what does this mean for the police? Well, in the case of violence against women, and it's certainly something that 
the police and researchers have learned often together. Uh, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Memphis, uh, a variety of, of locations. Uh, likely suspects in the cases of violence against women in, include spouses and family members and, and, and former lovers, and the police are uh, quite adept at taking a look at such individuals in, in looking to solve cases of domestic violence. But it's also the case that family violence and domestic violence need an intervention and they need uh, a proximate, a quick, a direct intervention because failing to intervene can lead to more violence. That there is a cycle of violence uh, that often occurs among intimates and that responding to only one of those and thinking the problem solved uh, creates an opportunity where uh, more violence can occur. Uh, one of the things we've seen over the course of the last uh, two decades and the rather remarkable uh, nationwide declines in homicide is that stranger-on-stranger -stranger violence has become increasingly rare. It's become a smaller share of the overall uh, uh, homicide victim offender relationship. Most violent events have a link between victims and offenders, and when victims and offenders have a prior relationship or a prior link, uh, we do better at finding suspects and making cases. And while it is true that victims and offenders know each other uh, to a much higher degree in violent crime, it's also the case that victims and offenders know each other in property crime, and strangers uh, uh, should not be the only suspects whom police are looking for and querying uh, neighborhood residents and victims about. So the relational distance uh, uh, finding is really an important one. Number eight is demography matters. Um, and, and by demography, we mean the characteristics of regions, of urban areas, of suburban areas, of broader metropolitan areas. We know that crime varies uh, by region. I, I myself lived in the Midwest for all, almost my entire life before moving to the Southwest. And one of the things that struck me was how different crime was from the Midwest once I moved to the Southwest much higher rates of property crime in the Southwest, and especially for those of us in Arizona, motor vehicle theft, much higher than, than where I lived in Missouri and in St. Louis, a place where the violent crime rates were three, four, five times higher uh, than they were in Arizona and, and in Phoenix. So the region causes uh, variation in the levels of crime, we know, and it's a long-standing fact, that uh, in urban areas, uh, crime rates are generally higher, particularly violent crime, but there is some variation in that violent crime finding when we look at cities uh, like Phoenix, for example, uh, like San Diego, another example, where the rates of violent crime are, are extremely low, and in, in the case of San Diego, perhaps as low or lower than those for the rest of the country. That said, uh, crime has increased in suburban and rural areas in the past several decades, um, and uh, we also know that in large metropolitan areas, central cities have a very strong influence on the crime rates in adjacent and surrounding municipalities. So when we think to for a second about what kind of interventions this might call for, we, we should think carefully about what another smart policing principle is, and that is we're not going to make progress in solving our problems unless we have a full and broad understanding of our problems. And so we've all gone to national conferences and we've heard a speaker talk about what works in Boston or what works in Chicago or what works in LA or what works in Orlando and we take that knowledge and we listen to the speaker and we do a little digging on the internet and we look for uh, resources like crimesolutions.gov, the link to which is at the end of the talk, and we get home and we say we want to do that, we want to do in my hometown what they did in LA or Boston or Chicago or Orlando. Well, we have to make sure that our crime problem 
shares key elements in common with that crime problem in whatever city the, the speaker, be it a researcher, a police executive, policymaker is talking about. Because responding to crime is not a one-size-fits-all kind of approach. Again, another S STI uh, uh, principle. We, we don't just have a set of software on the shelf that we can pull off and plug in and say, oh, this will solve my motor vehicle theft, or this will de deal with my uh, robbery and public transportation problem. Uh, things vary by region, and we need to make sure that our responses are crafted to fit the characteristics of our region. It is the case that suburbs historically have had lower rates of crime, but many suburbs across the U.S. have recorded increasing crime rates and need to look to best practices from urban areas to deal with the changing nature of crime in, in suburban areas. Um, and we think, too, that looking at the demography, the characteristics of the population, as well as the physical structure, and more on that in a bit, of an area to craft both patrol and other interventions and smart policing responses to crime. So again, the core of smart policing is developing first uh, an understanding of the nature of our crime problem. And one way to do that is to look closely at the demography, the population characteristics, uh, of the residents in our jurisdiction. I can remember working with the jurisdiction four years ago where immigration had changed very rapidly, more rapidly than was captured by census figures. And the police chief and the mayor thought they were dealing with a community that had a, a very low percent of new immigrants, under 10%, and when the uh, school superintendent got a chance to talk about the demography of the county that, that she, she, her schools were located in, she, she stated that over 40% of the students were members of new immigrant groups. So that understanding of demography can change quickly and points to the need not just to get past our fixed understanding and old understanding of problems, to but in, to involve a variety of partners in attempting to craft a response. We move to number seven, and, and it is, I think, one of the core and most important research findings that criminologists have uncovered over the course of the last 10 years, and that has to do with risk factors. Uh, identifying individuals who are at risk for involvement in crime. All of us have said if we only knew when they were about to commit a crime, we could intervene more appropriately, we'd be more successful in crafting prevention. And criminologists have identified, especially with regard to juveniles, um, key risk factors uh, for juveniles who are about to be involved in crime. And many of these make sense, and, and many of these are things that I think people maybe knew intuitively but can now act on uh, based on uh, really among the highest quality research, research that's been conducted uh, in Seattle and uh, in Pittsburgh and Rochester and, and by a group in St. Louis in multiple cities across the country. First, having delinquent friends is a key risk factor for involvement in delinquency. Uh, but having delinquent belief systems, that it's okay to take other people's property, that it's okay to hurt people, um, are, are, is also another risk factor. Experiencing traumatic life events, uh, seeing a parent arrested, uh, witnessing domestic violence, uh, experiencing the death of a parent, uh, while a child is young, under five years of age, is also a key risk factor. Lack of parental supervision, and, and we're all going, you know, duh, of course parental supervision is, is important. Um, but it's not the only risk factor, but it is an important uh, risk factor. But 
it's important to know as well that just one of these risk factors doesn't condemn, condemn a child to a life of crime or really alone make them that much more likely to be involved in crime. Early childhood aggression is a risk factor, and by early we're talking about kids uh, four, five, six, seven years of age in kindergarten in the very earliest uh, grades is a risk factor that's received considerable support in psychological and criminological research. And a commitment to street-oriented peers is another risk factor. The feeling that kids who are oriented to a street life, not, not, not homeless, but oriented toward hustling and getting ahead and getting a share of, of ill-gotten gains and crime uh, is, an, is a key risk factor. All that said, these, these are six well-supported risk factors. The more risk factors an individual has, and the earlier they start, the higher the risk for involvement in crime. So kids who have late onset for risk factors, and by late onset, 15, 16, 17, are not as at greater risk at kid, as kids who have these risk factors at an earlier stage of life. 8, 9, 10, 11. A child who's aggressive and has delinquent friends and a delinquent belief system at 8 is in a much different position for involvement in delinquency than a child who experiences those risk factors at 15, 16, or 17. Well, this suggests an, a number of interventions that law enforcement can, can be right at the heart of. And the first is effective identification of risk factors. Law enforcement often sees behaviors that other groups don't see. And one of the principles in smart policing that we like to emphasize, and I've mentioned it before and I'll come back to it again, is multiple roles being played by law enforcement. So the police see youth who are in trouble, but they also see probably a larger number of youth who are on the verge of trouble. Um, they're there, they're present when um, parents experience domestic violence or after the domestic violence has been experienced. Um, they see the results of crime victimization. It's, it's an opportunity when that crime tape goes up at a crime scene and lots of community residents mill around, especially young children, that's an opportunity for the police to work with partners in the faith-based community, the social service community, the crisis intervention community to get help for those kids who witnessed a violent crime or the aftermath of a violent crime and the consequences that that has. They can reach out and work with partners in the schools, in social service agencies, in city recreation groups to make sure that children who are moving down the road uh, to acquire risk factors and multiple risk factors uh, can get some interventions. It's also the case that the police can play an important role in not making risk factors worse. For example, um, if parents are to be arrested in the case, say, of a domestic violence or in the serving of a felony warrant for, for an outstanding felony warrant for a violent crime, Arresting a parent in front of the child can have very negative consequences. It can produce uh, one of the, the key six risk factors. So making those arrests in ways that doesn't traumatize youth and doesn't increase the risk factors is something that law enforcement can do. We want to move on to the, the sixth of the risk factors. Um, and, and this is another one that has really emerged and quite strongly from the research in the course of the last two decades of criminological research, and that is the importance of the role of victimization. We almost exclusively looked at offending in criminology, and we almost exclusively focus on offending in the criminal justice system. And there's a large body of very good research uh, that 
points to the role of victimization as perhaps being more important to understand as a link to offending than offending itself. And that's because of a couple key findings. And the most important of those key findings is that victimization typically precedes offending. That an, an individual becomes a victim before they become an offender. And so we often talk about delinquency prevention programs. And some of us remember uh, JBIG, the Juvenile Accountability Incentive Block Grant Program, about 15 or 20 years ago. And for many communities, that started as a delinquency prevention program, and it evolved to a victimization prevention program because most communities found that the pathway to involvement in crime was becoming a victim. It's especially true among juveniles that their victimization, either through a property offense, and, and larceny is um, the most common of juvenile victimizations, especially at school, things stolen from backpacks and lockers and cars, uh, and, and the prevalence, the widespread prevalence of cell phones and tablets and electronic devices uh, provide ample opportunities for youth victimization. Uh, that victimization often can create a motive to become an offender, to even the score, to try and uh, get back through force uh, or, or through engaging in a larceny uh, to get back uh, the phone, the tablet, the electronic device, the laptop from the car, from the locker, uh, from the backpack of the individual who stole it. And we know that there is a cycle of retaliation in delinquency and a cycle of retaliation uh, in, in adult crime that can include both violent and property victimizations. And the set, that cycle of retaliation often reflects uh, the relationship between victimization and offending. Individuals who are victimized are angry, and they want to even the score. That's, we know, especially true uh, in violent crime. Uh, but it's also the case in, in property crime, which can often lead to violent retaliation. So doing things to prevent victimization uh, is, is an important role for the police to play, and, and playing that role in victimization prevention in school uh, would be an especially good intervention. Um, and that can occur through some crime prevention tips. Schools that have school resource officers ought to be paying particularly close attention uh, to reducing uh, uh, victimization probabilities and working with individuals once they become victims to respond appropriately. It's also the case that being victimized a second time is higher than the probability of being victimized a first time. It's a, we know this is true with burglary, that houses that are burgled once are much more likely to be burgled a second time than a house is to be burgled the first time. So once people experience a burglary, they need to be very uh, vigilant in, in uh, implementing uh, interventions. Same is true for other forms of victimization, like being the victim of a larceny or a robbery or an assault. Well, if we think about the kinds of interventions that this suggests, and, and I, I think, again, that this is one of the really important findings that can change the way we think about another smart policing role, changing the way we think about how law enforcement and the community respond to crime, uh, the victimization prevention approach is something that can do that. Um, people who've been victimized initially, whether it's a personal crime or a property crime or a place crime, uh, ought to be encouraged to think about target hardening for uh, property crime and place crime. They ought to be encouraged uh, to think about uh, better ways to make themselves safe as they walk through the city. And this is another opportunity for the police to engage in uh, relationship building in the community. Uh, very important for law enforcement to have 
uh, relationships and strong relationships with the community, certainly to gain community trust, reporting crime, serving as witnesses, but also w when there's a bump or a strain in the relationship between police and the community, having a solid relationship to fall back on can help weather that storm. And I think what we've seen recently uh, it is an example of communities where the relationship wasn't as strong as it could be. So the police can use victimization as an opportunity to help build stronger relationships. And it's important, and the police hold the data, really, to identify the key times and places of risk uh, for victimization. We, we have thought through the years that imposing a curfew for juveniles would reduce their victimization. But what we've learned is that the most dangerous time of day is after school for children. Between the time they get out of school and their parents return home from work is the key time for youth victimization, especially for uh, uh, crimes of violence. So those are times when we ought to provide alternative activities, additional supervision, uh, and law enforcement can work with community partners, school partners, faith-based partners to encourage their participation at these times of fire victimization. Well, we've reached the first of our two at, at just past the halfway point of our stop and thinks. Um, we would ask the question, you know, here's a time for you to think about how could your department respond to these facts? Is there a crime problem that your city would like to address? Something that maybe traditional suppression and enforcement hasn't been making inroads into that one of these approaches could benefit your department and your city as it attempts to reduce crime. So I look to Chip to say, uh, see if there are any, and, and uh, Vivian and Zoe, if there are any questions that are on the line. Scott, I I've, I've got a question. Anything, Go ahead, Chip. Um, this whole thing about demographics, um, what's your understanding about the extent to which some of uh, these crime trends are creeping from urban areas to suburban areas? There was a time a while back when, when people were, you know, lamenting the uh, destruction of high-rise public housing and the impact that had on suburban communities. It's probably a bigger issue than that, but just curious about what, you know, what we know about kind of the creep into suburbia. <laughs> Well, well, certainly the last uh, couple of decades uh, have seen increasing movement uh, from city populations, especially of families, to suburbs. Cities have infilled, and, and um, certainly, you know, Chicago is a good example of a place where uh, young people and young professionals have moved in and moved in in fairly large numbers. But even though the number, population number might be roughly the same, uh, the composition of the population has changed. More single people, fewer families, more younger people, more women, uh, more unattached couples, uh, couples who aren't married. So there is um, uh, a demographic movement uh, away from many cities. It's not true in all places of the country. Cities are are thriving in, in particularly in, in the Northeast. Um, but we talk as well about new destination cities for immigrants. And, and, and for immigrant groups, places along the borders had historically been the places uh, where they moved to first. But it's, it's now the case that uh, smaller and medium cities, for example, in the Southeast, in, in Georgia, uh, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, are experiencing rather substantial inward migration uh, from, uh, from new immigrant groups. Um, so, you know, the police can play a role in also helping to understand uh, what the new migration uh, 
looks like, what languages they need to know, uh, what kind of recruiting they need to do to reflect the diversity of the community. <laughs> you know, just like anything else, given the, uh... Thank you, Scott. Uh, Zoe, are, aren't there any questions at this point? Uh, nothing in the chat right now, no. Well, I, I know we're running a, a, a little long, and what would you expect from a college professor? I, I will uh, move ahead to the final five, and perhaps at the end there'll be some questions. Um, maturational reform is powerful. Uh, this is really good news for us. Maturational reform, growing up and growing out of crime, is our best friend in the crime control industry. Uh, when, when kids move into their late teens, there really are two key periods of maturational reform. The first is in the late teens. As teenagers transition to adulthood, we see dramatic dec declines in crime among older teens compared to earlier teens and among people in their early 20s compared to people in their late teens. So if, if and, and for those of you who are parents, um, you know, sometimes you say if we can only hang on and get them out of those teenage years, they'll be okay. Um, there's certainly a lot of support for that in the research. But there's a second bump in maturational reform that occurs in the late 20s. Um, we observe that in particular among people leaving prison who may have done a couple of stretches uh, in, in prison, and they didn't learn anything when they got out in their early 20s and in their mid-20s, but when they get out in their mid, by the time they're in their mid-30s, they seem to have learned the lesson. Uh, it's something about finally growing up and not wanting to spend a life in prison. So what do we do? Well, uh, one of the things we can do is uh, to enhance the natural processes of matur maturational reform. Kids grow up. And, uh, and if we can get them through that tough period of 13, 14, 15 years old, uh, we're, we're going to have uh, uh, citizens who can be contributing uh, to the good of society. And the police can play a role in that uh, by making sure that kids who are looking to be on the right path get encouragement and support and not just suppression. But the police could also play a role working closely with agencies that assist the transition through each of those reforms. M many of you are, are probably familiar with Father Greg Boyle's Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. Uh, Chief Beck, Charlie Beck, the ch chief of the LAPD, works closely with the agency. He's been on their board. Homeboy's Industries has... Uh, a bakery and a coffee shop, and it's not uncommon. I myself have seen the chief having a cup of coffee uh, in, in the agency with, with the homegirls who run it, uh, showing his support for individuals trying to move out of crime, who, who've been in prison, who've been in, uh, in trouble before. Also important um, to look for crossover roles. Are there ways the police can play a non-suppression role and be involved in assisting that maturational reform. Traditionally, that's meant things like uh, police athletic leagues. It, it's meant things like mentoring. Uh, Scottsdale police, for example, uh, raise money to take children shopping, to go back to school, to buy back to school clothes and supplies, and also to take them shopping uh, at Christmas time to get them a present they wouldn't otherwise have. And it allows the police to be seen in a different and more supportive role. So if we knew, move to number four, um, it's a lesson that we learned well, and that is that disorder and crime go together. Um, lots of research. Uh, uh, been done that supports this over the course of the last two or three decades. Uh, broken windows is, is a good example of uh, a phrase we all know. Uh, neighborhoods that are disorganized, uh, we know this from almost 100 years ago in Chicago, uh, have higher levels of crime. That disorganization can be social, it can be cultural, it can be physical, uh, but but there are characteristics of disorder that include what we call incivilities. And for criminologists, incivilities 
is a fancy word for stray dogs, trash all over, kids hanging around at the corner without any apparent purpose, uh, broken glass on the street, broken windows in the buildings, places that look run down. Um, and the police can play a role working with other partners, again, a smart policing principle, look beyond the suppression role, and involve code enforcement, and bring in zoning, um, do training for landlords, for example, about how to deal with problem tenants and how to get the right tenants in a building. But high rates of, uh, of unemployment, among other indicators, are also characteristics of disorder. Uh, high rates of unemployment, single parents who live in poverty um, are, are, are demographic variables that are important to understanding how disorder and crime can go together. One of the important things we know, though, is the more concentrated these things are, the more likely we are to have higher rates of crime. So one bad house on a block doesn't produce large problems, but three or four clustered together tends to. This suggests, as we've noted, the police can work to identify these kinds of neighborhoods, report them to groups who can reduce the incivilities. San Diego, for example, Ottawa, Illinois, have been uh, very effective. Kankakee, Illinois, another group where, uh, another city where the police have brought code enforcement in to bring buildings up to code, reduce incivility. But while that's going on, the police can indeed intensify patrol and engage in one of the traditional suppression roles in places with high levels of in incivility. It may require more concentrated police effort, depending on how severe the problems are, uh, to, to kind of tamp down crime and step down the, the worst of those areas. We also know that groups enhance involvement in crime. Um, this really is a long-standing finding, but it's, I, I think the magnitude of it makes it even more important to understand. We've long known and understood that for juveniles, over 90% of delinquency uh, is committed in groups, and that lone offenders, especially for juveniles, tend to engage in different kinds of crimes than groups. Groups enable us and to do things we couldn't otherwise do. That's true on the positive side for teams and reinforcement, uh, but it's also true on the negative side for crime, especially uh, violent crime where groups are even more disproportionately involved. And that leads us to think uh, most obviously domestically about the role of gangs that enhance involvement in, in crime, especially violent crime, but but internationally and, and, and on some occasions domestically, uh, terrorist groups are, are another group uh, that are heavily involved in, in high uh, rates of crime. Part of this is because there's a generalization of insults or victimization from one member of the group to everybody. You know, so. If you hurt my friend, then I'm going to hurt your friend. And that generalization of the insult or victimization is what people take usually to expand the pool of victims when they retaliate. A lot of opportunities for the police, some of which are tricky. Um, targeting groups can be difficult. Too much police attention can increase solidarity in the group and give them recognition they otherwise might not have. In much of the research that's been done with gangs, many gang members take being targeted by the police as a badge of honor. Why else would the police be coming by and patrolling our neighborhood and trying to arrest us if they didn't think we were a bad gang, if they didn't think we committed a lot of crime? And that kind of recognition can make give gangs in a perverse way some credibility on the street. But it's also the case that having a specialized unit um, that can target group crime can pay dividends. Gang squads, for example, have been very effective and important in gathering information that has been used for investigation and prevention. And it's also the case that tracking group membership is really important and that individuals who leave the group need to be taken off uh, those lists and the like uh, once they've left the group.
we're counting down there. I feel like there should be a drum roll and a flashing number here. Uh, we're down to number two. A small fraction of offenders account for a large amount of crime. Well, if we could effectively identify them, and maybe we use risk factors to do that, and we use those risk factors uh, in, in neighborhoods where there's high levels of disorder. Again, a smart policing practice is using more than one piece of information to what we call triangulate. Um, study after study shows that in any community, a small number of offenders account for uh, a large number, a proportion of crime. In Philadelphia, 6% of all the youth who appeared in the, in the juvenile court, who were referred to the juvenile co court, accounted for nearly half of all the delinquency. If we could do something about that 6%, we could cut delinquency in half in Philadelphia. So identifying those high-rate offenders is really important. And indeed, there's been an SPI webinar uh, devoted simply to that uh, uh, purpose. And, and that's referenced at the end of the talk, and you can find it on the SPI website. Many of these individuals whom, in St. Louis, the police department used to call them frequent flyers uh, because they saw them so often. Many of them are on criminal justice supervision. They're on papers. They're on probation. They're on parole. They have outstanding warrants. So we have a way to reach out and touch them, if you will, uh, and, and in, engage them in an intervention. Um, it's also true of the places, though, as it is of individuals, that a small number of places account for a disproportionately high uh, uh, number of victimizations. Uh, mapping that out in a city can give us problem properties. Again, we can use this finding in conjunction with disorder and crime and victimization and demography to really build our interventions on a more solid foundation of facts. Well, this suggests first that we need to be careful and accurate in identifying high-rate offenders. And again, the uh, Lieutenant Woodmancy of the Madison Police Department uh, really has done an excellent job through SBI providing technical assistance and on, on the webinar uh, about high-rate offenders. Um, uh, law enforcement can develop objective crime-based criteria to identify these individuals. This can be used to enhance coordination between police and prosecution. Um, it can also be used uh, with CAD data um, to identify individuals who are at high risk of offending, and this enhances officer safety. Some jurisdictions uh, have a, a, a sign that flashes up on the mobile uh, data terminal, uh, the MDTs, when a high-rate offender is identified. So officer safety can be enhanced with this as well. And we come now to the number one of the top ten, and that is that crime is highly concentrated in space. This is probably one of the areas where what criminologists know and what law enforcement knows has the strongest overlap. Uh, Twenty years ago, the capacity for police to do mapping wasn't all that well developed. Uh, now the sophistication of mapping within police departments is, is greater than is done in, in most academic departments. We know there are hot spots of crime in, in most communities. But equally important, we know those hot spots vary. They vary in how intense they are, how big they are, what crimes occur there, how long they last. And so identifying those hot spots on a, a frequent basis. A map that's 30 or days old or older is probably not a very good map uh, for building uh, a strategy to prevent victimization. Maybe it works on the reactive side, but the best maps are fresh. And the best thing about maps is that they provoke further, further conversations. We also know that the hot spots, and again, combining some of these 10 key findings, often coexist and overlap with some of the other facts, particularly disorder, risk factors, groups, demography.
So what do we do about this? Well, the first is, as was the case uh, with identifying high-rate offenders, correctly and carefully identifying these concentrations is important. Crime analysis in police departments does a great job at this, and, and there is SPI crime analysis support, and many of the SPI projects have used crime analysis quite effectively at both the front end and the back end of their, of their analysis. However, policing hotspots is more than just putting cops on dots. It involves the innovative use of smart policing, perhaps using suppression in conjunction with other approaches, with knock and talks, um, with, with collecting uh, information about communities, with patrolling with other partners like probation or parole or juvenile officers, or cooperation with city agencies. In the end, though, and while this is true of this finding, the high concentration, it's true, I think, and it's a thread that runs through all of these when translating them for law enforcement. Having strong police community relationships is a key to making any of these work to responding to concentrations of crime. So we can stop at this point and, uh, for a minute and, and reflect. Um, we, I understand that there's some, uh, some questions that we could take that have been submitted uh, to our moderator. Uh, and why don't we move to those at this time? Hi, Scott. Uh, so this is Zoe, and I'm the one who's been uh, messaging everyone from the Smart Policing Initiative account on here. Um, so I think that some of these questions might be a little bit complex to answer in just a few moments. So I'd just like to let everyone know that we will definitely make note of all of these. And pull together as a team and maybe come up with some more in-depth answers that can be posted to our website and shared with the list of attendees. But let's start with the first one I received, which was someone inquiring about what's the peak of the age crime curve for teens? So I'm guessing they're looking at, you know, what's that one year that's the really serious year for teenagers who are participating in crime? More 13-year-olds are arrested every year than any other age group followed by 14, then 12, then 15, and then 16, 11. So that early 12, 13, 14, the number of people arrested at that age is extremely high. That, that's the peak. After that, it starts to go down. Um, we, we have, in some ways, more opportunities to deal with 12, 13, and 14-year-olds because um, we got schools as partners. Uh, we probably still have uh, parents as partners in many instances. We have um, social service agencies. And there's a greater willingness often to provide services for younger kids than kids who've been through the system multiple times. So it is the case that most kids get in trouble, but it's also the case that most kids grow out of trouble. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so the next question I have is, uh, generally speaking, what competencies in the police department are the most critical for addressing the findings that you've been presenting during the webinar? Leadership, I think, is at, at the core. Um, po police, chiefs, police chiefs have very difficult jobs, and they're not getting any easier. Um, so, but in addition to leadership, uh, uh, and, and I think this comes from leadership, a commitment to innovate when innovation is called for, a commitment to be open uh, to change, uh, a commitment to a variety of roles, and the ability both to build partnerships, but they only can't exist at the top, right? If, only, if the chief's the only one who's got a good relationship uh, with members of the community or generates trust in the community. That doesn't help the department all that much. And chiefs need to devolve that ability uh, to uh, commanders and command staff who need to teach it and impress it upon uh, uh, line-level staff and sergeants and, and patrol officers. 
um, that this is a core value of what we do uh, and that we reflect uh, uh, the needs of the community in what we do. Um, and I think some of the best chiefs and the most uh, effective chiefs I've seen are chiefs who've been willing to listen. Um, one of the measures I use when I visit a police department and I do ride-alongs and I talk to the to patrol especially is how often they get out of the car. And, and I can tell you that this has really changed dramatically over the last 30 years. Uh, the getting out of the car and interacting with citizens and being seen in a non-suppression role I, I think is, is really a key thing. So, you know, there are, there are a number of components that um, make police departments effective. Um, but the ability to value and train in and teach and reinforce person skills, I think, remains at, at the top of that list. Thank you again, Scott. Um, so this question was um, about sort of the post-9-11 policing strategy in the universe that we all live in now, um, asking whether you feel that policing agencies have generally strayed away from community-oriented policing um, as a result of the concerns about domestic terrorism and other uh, related sorts of events. The, I, I think that there is some truth to that observation. Um, the pressures on the police to respond to uh, multiple sorts of events. And I think if, if we take, for example, um, the Boston Marathon, uh, j just you know, a year and a half ago, roughly, um, that's an event for which uh, the Boston Police Department, under Commissioner Davis's leadership, trained for, not that specific event, but they trained for a disruption. They did tabletops. They did field training. Uh, they did case studies from uh, other uh, jurisdictions, uh, it, both in this country and around the world. They interacted with federal law enforcement partners. They interacted with federal and local non-law enforcement partners. And um, you know, one of the most important groups in the response that that reduced the loss of life and the damage experienced was the great trauma units in and around where that event took place. And there had been enough foresight in Boston to include the trauma response in the training. And so there was a protocol and there was the ability to communicate quickly and effectively uh, with trauma service providers so that this was not seen simply as a law enforcement response. Now, that said, one of the lessons learned from the Marathon bomber and the Marathon bombing incident in Boston is how important having a good relationship with the community was because there were so many tips and so much uh, uh, Twitter traffic and so many cell phone photographs and videos and, and so much information provided to the Boston Police Department because they had worked to build up trust that they were in a position to get that information. So I don't think that being ready to respond to terrorism incidents or to you know terrible incidents such as this precludes building community relationships. In fact, I think a more effective response to terrorism and, and exceptional events can take place when there is a foundation and a culture of relationships with the community. Because regardless of the crime, the police enterprise runs on information. And even with CCTV, and even with monitoring uh, the Twitterverse and Facebook and all of the electronic social media that goes on, a large part of that information still resides with the public who needs to give it up to law enforcement. So building strong relationships is a key to solving crime of a variety of types. Thanks again, Scott. Um, so we have a question about um, police who work in communities that have transient populations who 
move either for work or for school um, in and out of the community frequently. And this person was wondering if you have any strategies specifically to address those sorts of transient populations. Uh, a good question and, and certainly an issue that uh, we deal with in the Southwest and is dealt with in, in agricultural communities. Um, you know, I think the first issue and underlying all of this is, is the key smart uh, policing principle, which is to understand the nature of your problem. Uh, work with the agencies, whether it's a resettlement group or a, a church or uh, an advocacy group um, who uh, make the transitions uh, for these groups, know when they come and when they leave, know where, where they stay. Uh, and and uh, and what they do, and here's a, a part where one of these, I think, one of these ten principles really stands out with the transient population, and that's their levels of victimization. Many transient populations inherently do not trust authority, and and while the police are part of that, they're not the only authority that they don't trust, and one of those authorities is the banking industry. Um, and so they may carry their cash on them, or they may keep their money in the car, or they may keep their money where it is that they stay, or, or they may let a friend hold their money. And, and so they're at risk for victimization. And when they become victimized, the consequences of that are, are certainly quite severe, in large part because they don't start from a base of having very much. Um, and they can become involved, transients can become involved in crime as a consequence of becoming victims of crime. So working with uh, shelter providers, uh, working with transition service providers uh, to identify victimization uh, prevention mechanisms. For example, uh, the city of New Haven uh, gave identity cards uh, to transient individuals who could provide two forms of identification. And those identity cards could be used uh, to, to, in a sense, like a uh, prepaid credit card to store up money at a bank and to access city services. So, uh, you know, uh, it's a difficult problem. Um, there are also problem-solving guides uh, that, that the COPS office has developed. And there is a problem-solving guide on dealing with transient populations. Uh, so I think that's another resource um, that, that we would point you to. Um, there are a couple of uh, FAQs um, that we would post. One of the questions we get is, aren't some of these a form of, racial, of, of profiling, whether racial or ethnic or community profiling? Um, and used mistakenly, they can be. Um, but built on solid evidence, uh, evidence that's recent and documented by multiple sources, um, in, in combination with strong police community relationships, uh, I think that's an issue that, that can be overcome. Uh, there are 10 or 15 more findings we could present uh, for which the evidence is good, but not quite as good. Um, and so uh, these are 10 for which the evidence is, is very solid. Um, these are true in most communities, and, and I'll just briefly comment on, on the last of the FAQs, and, and that's examples of communities where these facts have been put to work. And here I would direct you to the SPI website. Um, almost all of the SPI interventions to date that I'm familiar with have integrated one or more, and I think more is the operative phrase here, of these principles. And I'll, I'll just close my, I mentioned my email, uh, I'm available by email and my email's at the bottom uh, of this final slide, but more importantly, you can go to the SPI Library and Multimedia Resource Center, um, a wonderful uh, uh, resource. Uh, the Project Safe Neighborhood site has all kinds of information and interventions. Uh, there's good piece about family and community influence on youth victimization that talks about um, uh, juveniles and juvenile communities. And the crimesolutions.gov uh, 
uh, is something that I look at frequently when communities or law enforcement or other criminal justice agencies ask me, you know, what should we do and, and what should we think about? I want to just close by uh, thanking the uh, patient members of the audience for their patience and participation, and again reinforce uh, Chip's comments about the extraordinary leadership and support that BJA has provided for the Smart uh, Policing Initiative from the start and up until the present moment. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Coldren uh, to wrap up. Okay, Scott, that's uh, a really, really good job of synthesizing and summarizing a huge volume of information. I think you just delivered in a really strong fashion a whole semester's worth of, of uh, material. So thank you again very much. Um, I, I, I do want to comment on a couple of things that have come up during the, the presentation today. Uh, I think Scott's point about the importance of understanding victimization patterns and trends, which is slightly more recent, is, uh, is a really important one. We have several of our smart policing initiatives that are looking at uh, specifically at issues of repeat victimization. They're excellent combinations of good police work and good community outreach good use of focus deterrence uh, strategy. So smart policing has picked up on that in a very strong way. And there's an, another good example on our website from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office where they, in fact, addressed uh, an immigrant population that was being brutally victimized. Um, and again, through good detective work and good community policing and outreach, they, they, they had some great success with that. So. Um, I think what Scott has, has given us, you know, provides us with a lot of food for thought, may raise as many questions <laughs> as, uh, as it's, you know, raised good points. And I encourage anybody in the audience, if you have questions or information needs to contact us or contact uh, BJA, there's a ton of resources and technical assistance available from a variety of sources that, that we can help you with. And I will commit to taking all of the questions that were submitted and, uh, you know, pulling our team together and some of our sites and coming up with some good thorough answers to each and every one of those questions. So we'll commit to doing that over the next week or so. Um, I'll make one other point and I want to turn over to, to Kate for a minute. Um, this issue that Scott raised early on about taking what we know from research and translating it into, into good practice is really at the heart of what smart policing and I think of what modern policing is all about. Uh, so please, when you get that evaluation form and those questions, please let us know how you think we did on that particular point and what you think we might do better or we might do in addition to what we're doing now to help, help bring that research information into the uh, areas of police practice and justice system practice generally. That's very important to all of us. Again, uh, Scott, thank you. Zoe, thank you very much, and, and Vivian and everyone who worked on this webinar. Kate, please uh, take, take the floor for a few minutes if you'd like. Um, and I want to thank all, everybody who viewed today's webinar. And we really did intend this to be an accessible discussion. You know, bridges what we've learned with what police agencies can actually do to affect positive change in their communities. And, and, and I think Scott did an excellent job of doing that. And, and Chip, your comments also kind of draw those connections as well. Um, and of course, Chip and Vivian and Zoe and everyone at CNA who pulled together this really excellent webinar. Uh, for the field, you know, you have my gratitude and, and BJ leadership gratitude as well. Um, and before we conclude, I wanted to highlight a couple of resources available through the Office of Justice programs that are very, very relevant, um, you know, to, to the things that Scott spoke about today and to departments looking to explore you know, the, the adoption of evidence-based approaches um, to particular crime issues. And the first, which Scott actually mentioned is crimesolutions.gov, which is a website sponsored by the Office of Justice Programs, um, which contains a tremendous amount of easy-to-understand information about what programs and practices, quote, unquote, work 
in the criminal justice, juvenile justice, and crime victim services arenas. Um, and, at the, and these are uh, approaches that have been upheld through research in a rather rigorous uh, vetting process. And all of the programs, pro, programs profiles have easy to understand rating so that law enforcement professionals can really identify those programs that are effective versus those that really have had no effect. And so I encourage all of you just explore the site as a resource. Um, the second is a BJA-sponsored training and technical assistance pro program called Crime Analysis on Demand. And Scott referenced, you know, just the power, you know, that crime analysis, you know, has brought to policing and how it really is at the heart of understanding, um, a, you know, a, a, an agency or a community's crime problem. And through this particular program, our National Training and Technical Assistance Center offers law enforcement agencies assistance in enhancing these capabilities, you know, to analyze and use data to make informed decisions around prevention and effective responses uh, to their crime issues. Um, we can conduct needs assessments. We can provide recommendations to address any analysis um, capability gaps in your agency. And we can offer also comprehensive training for your crime analysts. And so for more information on crime analysis on demand, um, that's available at www.bjatraining.org. Um, and also our SPI sites can contact CNA for more information as well um, if they're interested. And again, thank you so much to everyone. And uh, you have my gratitude. And it's always a pleasure uh, you know, to, to go back to basics about what we know and how we can help communities. Great. Um, thank you, Kate. Appreciate those comments. And uh, again, um, Thanks to everybody who participated and uh, signed on to this web webinar. We're very encouraged by the interest that we've seen here. And as I said before, we're very interested in helping out as many people as we can with questions that have come up as, you know, as a result of this web webinar. So please don't hesitate to contact us and ask us more questions. Okay? Thanks, everybody. I think we're going to close this out. So. Um, Again, I thank everybody. Take care. Thank you.